There's a calm in this section over here. It's always that way. My name is Frank. I'm one of the pastors. I'm glad you're here. Uh, we are uh, on a journey together, and every week we come here because we know we need to surrender more so we can be transformed more. And uh, we've all, uh, many of us have experienced this relationship with Christ, and we can't fully understand it, but what we know is that we become a different person and we really didn't do it. It, it happened to us. And so we come here every week and we, we learn that there are areas of our lives that God just wants us to give to him and allow him to, to do with us what he wants. And so we are uh, in a series where we've been looking at the book of Revelation. We're in week 25. Uh, we're all the way up to Revelation 13, which is good. Um, and uh, we're kind of in the middle of the tribulation period. And if you don't know what that is, then um, you could binge watch 25. So no, um, the tribulation is this time, a seven year time. And we're right in the middle of it. And it's between different judgments, the seal and, and trumpet judgments and the final judgment, the great tribulation, the last three and a half years that come when the. sort of pause, John, the author of Revelation, uh, God, the author of Revelation, stops and says, hey, I want to introduce you to some characters, to some people. I want you to understand who the players are going to be as this moves forward. Now, I think it's a good time right now to sort of stop and say, okay, what, what was John's big concern when he wrote the book of Revelation? Other than getting down, obviously, everything that he saw in the vision but John, as he got older in his life, he was known as the disciple that, of love. He had this heart for his people, his heart for the people that he had taught, his heart for believers, and he was very concerned, and we know this from 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John, he was very concerned about false teachers who could actually lead astray the people that he'd been teaching his whole life. He's known as the disciple who loves he wanted to make sure that the people that he loved would not be fooled by false teachers. He called the false teachers antichrist, people who are the opposite of Christ. About 20 years before he wrote the book of Revelation, he wrote this, 1 John 4, 1. Beloved, that means believers, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they are from God. For many false prophets have gone out into the world. By this you know the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God. And every spirit that does not confess Jesus is not from God. This is the spirit of the Antichrist, which you heard was coming and now is in the world already. John was concerned about false teachers in end times. And I believe John is warning the Jewish people one more time about how Satan will mimic the things of God. This satanic dream team that Satan is putting together is going to deceive and manipulate the remaining Jewish people and convince them they're following God when they're actually not. Now, since the beginning of the Bible, Satan has wanted to be just like God. As we get to end times, he starts trying to mimic God and to reproduce what Jesus has done. We get to the midpoint of the tribulation. We have Satan. He's cornered. He's cast to earth. He's ready to fight. He's lost the battle with God. He's lost the battle for Israel. And now he's going to go after anybody who can who represents God, primarily individual Jewish believers in Christ. Incredibly, though, it seems that even at this point, there may still be some who are undecided. Or perhaps they've decided and not made it publicly known which side they're on. So Satan is arranging well, what I call his dream team to force loyalty to Satan. Last week we saw the dragon, Satan, and we've seen the beast, the Antichrist. Today we're going to be introduced to a third and final member of Satan's team. So let's dive in and take a look. Revelation 13, verse 11. Then I saw another beast rising out of the earth. It had two horns like a lamb, and it spoke like a dragon. The second beast that John now sees comes out of the earth, not the sea. The beast, while much more appealing to the eyes, is just as evil as the dragon and the first beast. 
In fact, in some ways, this beast may be more devastating because clearly his purpose is to deceive. Everything about him from his appearance and actions is designed to deceive. He, he looks like a lamb. He, he looks like something that wouldn't bother you, but his voice is that of a dragon. The beast out of the earth is thought by some to be of Jewish ethnic origin because they, they say basically that uh, he rises out of the earth rather than the sea, and the Jewish people saw the sea as the raging Gentile nation. So there's some question as to whether this person, this new person we're being introduced to, is of Jewish descent or not. However, wherever he's from and whatever he comes from, the text is clear that he's not what he seems to be. On the one hand, he has two horns like a lamb, but when he speaks, his speech betrays him and he sounds like a dragon. This beast may be the most dangerous one as he's going to give the impression of gentleness and harmlessness, but this lamb is going to speak like Satan. You remember from last week how we looked at the Antichrist and was the culmination of all the evil leaders of the world, how this beast incorporates all the others? This second beast is similar, but instead of representing all the leaders of all the nations of all the world, he's going to be the culmination of every false teacher, every false messiah, every false pastor, and every false religious leader. He'll be the smoothest of the smooth. You're going to like him. We talked about it last week. This guy is going to draw people to him. He, he's going to be a great persuader of people. Like the Antichrist, the masses are going to love him. They'll be naturally attracted to him. He'll encourage everyone to pursue the natural desire they already have. You see, we are all born enemies of God, and he wants us to stay that way. People can also be enemies of God. In fact, our natural state, our fallen sinful state, puts us in opposition to God. The Bible uses the word enemy to describe a person's relationship with God before they give their lives to Christ. Romans says that while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son. Another verse describes people before salvation as alienated and hostile in mind doing evil deeds. You see, before a person is saved, they're in opposition to God. They're an enemy of God because they naturally reject anything of God. Person's actions and goals directly oppose God's purposes. The second beast wants to encourage everyone to follow that desire. Jesus himself, I believed, warned us specifically about this second beast, the one who appears like a lamb but speaks like a dragon. Matthew 7, 15, beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing but inwardly are ravenous wolves. That's who this person's going to be. While the first beast is called the Antichrist, the second beast is called the false prophet because Jesus says, beware of the false prophet, the one that looks like a sheep, but inwardly is a ravenous wolf. So he warned us. John just thought he was concerned about false teachers. Now he's seen the beast. The smooth-talking, likable, charismatic, religious leader who acts like a lamb. This deceiver, I believe, brought John more distress than the Antichrist. He's the minister of Satan's propaganda. He's the one that will get everyone to worship the Antichrist. He'll be the one who will have great persuasive powers. He's going to target Jewish people. He's the culmination of all the false teachers and false prophets. He'll have false miracles and he'll give out false gifts. John knows that Satan has been mimicking God from the very beginning. God sent prophets to speak truth to the world. Satan sent false prophets. God gives us teachers to teach his word. Satan sends false teachers. Jesus is the light of the world. Satan appears as an angel of light. Satan takes God's spiritual gifts and causes them to be misused and confused. God performs miracles, and Satan performs supernatural miracles in order to deceive. 
It's a challenge here. Revelation 12. It exercises all authority of the first beast in its presence, of the Antichrist, and makes the earth and its inhabitants worship the first beast whose mortal wound was healed. This beast exercises all authority of the first beast. He's a mediator to the people. He works to cause the inhabitants of the earth to worship the first beast, the Antichrist, who suffered a mortal head wound and somehow survived. Again, mimicking Christ's death and resurrection. The, the inhabitants of the earth here really just mean unsaved humans who remain. They're deceived by the miracles of the false prophet. He's been empowered to perform them. You see, this false prophet is focused on deceiving the remaining non-believers on earth and seal their commitment to the Antichrist. It's incredible, but all the way through the tribulation, we still have people on earth who've not yet decided, it appears. This is someone who the role of the false prophet is to enhance the worship of the Antichrist. Likely, this person will have spiritual authority already known. It'll likely be a trusted world religious leader, a religious expert who comes out of the remains of the Roman Empire, and he will begin to speak falsehoods. Many, many, many believe that it will be the Pope. Someone who demands and is known to have utmost authority in the Catholic Church worldwide, one who is thought to be the reincarnated Peter, and thus one who speaks not only for God, but as God with his authority. This beast arises from the remnant of the Roman Empire and reestablishes the role of spiritual leader on earth. But this beast is essentially a satanic prophet who leads the world to worship the Antichrist. Now, this isn't going to be very hard, by the way. Most of the people left on earth in the mid-tribulation want to worship the Antichrist. They already see him as godlike. He overcame a mortal head wound. He knows everything. He's the greatest leader the world has ever seen except for Jesus. And he brought world peace, one economy, one government, one military, and he's been humble and caring, and he reestablished peace in the Middle East, and he allows them to worship at the temple and sacrifice animals. Most of the world, remember, loves him. And now he's going to pretend what many are already thinking he is, God. The false prophet will speak about him, point to him, and glorify him. But the thing that he does not allow is free will. No one will be able to reject the claims of the Antichrist and live. Note the scripture here tells us and validates later, he makes the earth and its inhabitants worship the first beast. He makes them do that. If you decide not to worship the Antichrist, you will cease to be a world inhabitant. It's the way it works. Eventually, his desire is to have everybody remaining on earth worship the beast. Verse 13, it performs great signs, even making fire come down from heaven to earth in front of people. And by the signs that it is allowed to work in the presence of the beast, it deceives those who dwell on earth. It's not totally decided, however. Many will be firmly entrenched in their camps by this point. Uh, there are going to be those who follow Jesus and those who follow the Antichrist. But some are going to be looking for signs. They, they still want to see the miraculous before they can decide. In fact, the Jews will likely demand signs in order to validate that this message is from God. 1 Corinthians 1.22 for Jews demand signs and Greeks seek wisdom. But we teach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to the Jews and folly to the Gentiles. But to those who are called both Jews and Greeks, Christ the power of God and the wisdom of God. Unfortunately, we're going to see that supernatural signs don't always come from God. Notice the pronoun choice here. He keeps calling the beast an it. It exercises authority. It performs great signs. To John and God, this beast is an it. 
and it wants to deceive everyone. In order to achieve this feast, he's, or this feast, he, he's got to perform great miracles. He's got to do great signs, even to the extent of causing fire to come down from heaven in full view of man. I mean, imagine that, this, this man who claims to be a religious leader that everybody already likes calls down fire from heaven. What do you think the world's going to think? And it's important that John highlights this particular miracle. Every Jewish person knew that the return of Elijah would precede the arrival of the Messiah. Remember that in the Passover Seder, that they go to the door to see if Elijah's there yet. Now we have one who will call down fire from heaven, just like Elijah did at the top of Mount Carmel to destroy the false prophets of Baal. The target audience now is Jewish, and they will see this as confirmation sign that Elijah has indeed returned, and thus the Antichrist is likely their Messiah. In addition, remember the two witnesses that we study, they're able to destroy people with fire coming out of their mouth. This false prophet is going to bring fire down from heaven, probably seen then as superior. Now here's the problem. Supernatural events mean that they have occurred outside of the natural order of things. Something supernatural does not stamp ownership. There are supernatural things of God and there are supernatural things of Satan. And remember, Satan loves to mimic God. Let me repeat that just because something is supernatural and miraculous does not mean it came from God. Many are going to be fooled because they see things they can't explain and they instantly assume it must be from God. But let's go back and look at a few of these. In the days of Exodus, Aaron performed miracles and up to a point was matched miracle for miracle by the magicians of Egypt. Way back in Deuteronomy, God told us to be watchful and warned us about this. Deuteronomy 13.1. If a prophet or dreamer of dream arises among you and gives you a sign or a wonder, and the sign or wonder that tells you to, comes to pass, and if he says, let's go after other gods which you have not known, let us serve them, you shall not listen to the words of that prophet or that dreamer of dreams. For the Lord your God is testing you to know whether you love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul. Way back in Deuteronomy, he warned people, about false teachers who do miraculous things. Jesus said that some who work miracles, even in his name, were false followers and would perish in hell. Matthew 7, 21, Not every one of you who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but the one who does the will of my Father who's in heaven. On that day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name? cast out demons in your name, and watch this, do many mighty works in your name. And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. Paul said that the Antichrist will come, 2 Thessalonians 2, verse 8, and when the lawless one will be revealed, whom the Lord Jesus will kill with the breath of his mouth and bring to nothing by the appearance of his coming, the coming of the lawless one is by the activity of Satan with all power and false signs and wonders and with all wicked deception for those who are perishing because they refuse to love the truth and so be saved. Knowing all this, the, the emphasis here is on signs and wonders and the concern that many believers think if something supernatural happens, that must be God. No, he's the mimicker. And particularly as we get closer and closer to end times, he's going to mimic more and more what God has done. Some Christians scare me when they say, you can really know where God is and where his power is by seeing if there's signs and wonders. Thinking this way is going to leave yourself open to deception. Signs and wonders will be present among Christians, but the real mark of God's truth is love and truth. The ability to employ these signs as wonder is for the purpose of deceiving the people who live on earth. 
Remember, the last half of the tribulation is all about reaching the Jewish people. They demand signs, and that's exactly what the beast is going to give them. Why do they demand signs? Because throughout the Old Testament, God gave signs to validate what he was saying. They look for signs. Greeks look for wisdom. Jesus, however, warned about this exact moment. Matthew 24, 24, for false Christs and false prophets will arise, here it is again, and perform great signs and wonders so as to lead astray, if possible, even the elect. See, I have told you beforehand. That which Jesus anticipated is now unfolding to a time and degree that's never been duplicated. Those who are without discernment see fire dropping down from heaven to earth. They're bound to see that as an act of God, particularly since their natural inclination is to worship the Antichrist anyway. And therefore, a vast majority of the inhabitants on earth are going to be deceived. Verse 14, And by the signs that it is allowed to work in the presence of the beast, it deceives those who dwell on earth, telling them to make an image for the beast that was wounded by the sword and yet lived. And it was allowed to give breath to the image of the beast so that the image of the beast might even speak and might cause those who would not worship the image of the beast to be slain. The next act, this is full-fledged, straight-up idolatry. The false prophet orders that an image in honor of the beast who was wounded by the sword and yet lived should be set up. It seems strange to us sometimes to have the whole world give this kind of worship to a man. But we've seen the personality cults of totalitarian governments, haven't we? Totalitarian states of the Soviet Union, communist China, and their omnipresent pictures and statues of Stalin and Mao. And we see that pattern is going to be ultimately fulfilled by the Antichrist. The image of the beast is going to be animated in some way. It's, it's going to have breath and it's going to be able to speak. And this image is going to be supernatural or, or technological, but the result either way is going to be impressive. It'll be like no idol anybody's ever seen before. Do you remember what the psalmist said when he talked about pagan idols? The idols of the nations are silver and gold, the work of human hands. They have mouths, but they do not speak. They have eyes, but they do not see. They have ears, but they do not hear. Nor is there any breath in their mouths. Those who make them become like them, so do all who trust in them. Well, this idol is going to have a mouth and breath, and is going to be able to speak and hear and breathe and, it seems, judge. Many think this will be some sort of robotic hologram. Either way, it'll have the image of the Antichrist wounded and will speak and judge those brought in front of it. Either mandate death sentences for those who refuse to worship it. Once again, Satan mimicking the judgment seat of Christ. Separating those who worship him from those who don't. Forcing people to once and for all decide to follow Jesus or follow the Antichrist. This is the image that Daniel and Jesus and Paul spoke about that they called the abomination of desolation. An idolatrous image set up in the holiest place in the rebuilt temple. It is an abomination in that it is supreme idolatry and it's a desolation in the sense that it's going to bring judgment from God like the world has never seen before. It's the summation of the power of the Antichrist. He's got a three and a half year rise and a three and a half year fall, and then he's done. Verse 16, it also, it causes all, both small and great, both rich and poor, both free and slave to be marked on the right hand or the forehead so that no one can buy or sell unless he has the mark, that is the name of the beast or the number of his name. Now remember, Satan is all about mimicking God. He didn't come up with this on his own. He remembers what happened that we read in Revelation 7, where God had marked his followers. He's not creative, he's just an imitator. Then I saw another angel ascending from the rising of the sun with the seal of the living God, and he called with a loud voice to the four angels who'd been given power to harm the earth and the sea, saying, do not harm the earth or the sea or the trees until we have sealed 
the servants of our God on their foreheads. And I heard the number of the sealed, 144,000 sealed from every tribe of the sons of Israel. God previously had sealed his believers. Now Satan's like, that's a good idea. I'm going to seal my believers. This mark could be a tattoo. It could be a brand. It could be a microchip. Well, we don't know. Microchips were approved by the FDA for human insertion in 2006. Technology seems to be leaning towards a microchip of some kind. The mark is the name of the beast or the number of its name. The technology to give people a mark that allows them to buy or sell is available. There are many different ways it could happen. Such programs are proposed and tested constantly. I'm stunned that since I taught this series five years ago, how much this particular thing has grown. I want to read to you an article from Market Watch that came out last week. Indiana is a step closer to forbidding companies from forcing workers to implant microchips in their bodies. Following the state House of Representatives unanimous passage of a bill last week that could make it the 12th state with such a law. Is this just a bill to protect against the stuff of science fiction? Not at all, say experts on workplace law and technology who worry the rice-sized microchips can open up massive questions about worker privacy and company surveillance. I would definitely not call it far-fetched, says a Cornell University labor and employment professor on the ethical use in the workplace technology. It's been three years since the workers at one Wisconsin company voluntarily had microchips inserted in their hands, and there are more companies out there, but they're probably not advertising it. These workers, typically on the IT side of business, get an implant for personal use. The microchip is typically inserted between the thumb and index finger. The chips company starts selling at around $50 plus an optional $50 for insertion with an affiliated doctor or piercing expert. In the same way certain smartphone users get emails, their personal phone, chip customers use their chip at work so they can, for example, open up doors without company badges or key fobs. In Sweden, people have been using microchips to store their emergency contact information and pay for train rides and gym memberships. They think the implanted chips could potentially eliminate all sorts of lost product, here it comes, the cell, all sorts of lost productivity from lost key badges. But he says something of the current orders he thinks are motivated by something else. Here it comes. I would say it's probably the cool factor. A handful of businesses told him they were implanting chips for media attention. There's definitely a marketing angle here, he says. What we're trying to say is employers cannot go to employees and say we're doing away with name badges and microchipping all of you. The Indiana Bill's author, Representative Alan Morrison, a Republican, told MarketWatch a week after the 96 to 0 vote. Employers cannot condition a job offer on chip insertion, and if workers lose their job for refusing to implant one, the bill lets them sue for damages. Yet even as more lawmakers worry about implantable devices, people getting more enmeshed in technology and possibly big tech surveillance, smartphones now unlock with a face scan or a thumbprint, consumers can carry out financial transactions with biometric mobile wallets, Workers are more accepting or at least more aware of the possibility their company is monitoring their moves. Companies have already found ways to track workers and there are no state laws laying ground rules on the issue, but there's a difference with microchip. You can never walk away from that. The company knows where you are 24 seven. There you go. Market watch last week. No one can buy or sell without the mark. They're forcing people into a decision, not a free will decision, a mandated one. The decision will be clear. This mark is not just to allow commerce. The scriptures are very clear. You're not putting this mark in just so you can do commerce. It's the mark of total surrender and absolute following of the Antichrist and a clear rejection of Jesus Christ. The point to be made is nowhere in the text does it say what the mark will be. All suggestions show a variety of possibilities. In whatever form, it's to restrict economic exchange for those who do not invoke the name of the beast or the number of his name. If microchips caused a stir, 
The next verse causes a speculation extravaganza that has started pretty much about the time John wrote this next verse, and it hasn't stopped to today. This calls for wisdom, John says. Let the one who has understanding calculate the number of the beast, for it is the number of man, and his number is 666. What does that mean? Well, since John penned this throwdown challenge, everyone, it seems, has an answer to the meaning of triple sixes. Earliest writings came from the first century. This was written in the 90s. Within 10 years, they're already talking about it. All right, John intended only his intimate associates would be able to decipher the number. So successful were his precautions that Irenaeus, a hundred years later, couldn't figure out who he was talking about. We now have 1,800 or 2,000 years further, we still don't know who he's talking about. Let me just review with you, though, a few of the ideas in case you come across them. One is a common concept in ancient Greek and Hebrew that letters were assigned numerical values. And you added up the letters in your name and you had a value. Uh, this was validated uh, by in graffiti in the ruins of Pompeii written, uh, says this, and this is so romantic. Oh, this is great, you're gonna love this. I love her whose number is 545. <laughs> Pompeii love note. Does this tell us who the beast is by figuring the numerical value of the name and adding it up to see who's 666? Well, using this method, candidates for the Antichrist have been suggested as the Pope, John Knox, Martin Luther, Napoleon, Hitler, Mussolini, Stalin, and so forth. But schemes for unlocking the number are as confusing as they are endless. Some commentators observe that there are six Roman numerals. Did you know that? I didn't know that. I think I do that. If you add them up, guess what you get? 666. Some say that that means the Antichrist must be Roman. Or they point out that all the numbers from 1 to 36 add up to 666. I didn't know that either. And beast in the evil sense appears 36 times in the Bible. You can see, right? One persistent opinion, especially in the early church, was this, this identified Nero. But to make Nero fit, they had to take a variant of the Greek form of the Latin name, transliterate it into Hebrew characters, and then count it. The letters of Jesus add up to 888. 666 may be a counterpart of the name of Jesus, or 666 may be God's evaluation of such a satanic counterpart in that it falls way short. As compared to the number 888, the number 666 may signify an unholy trinity. It's an imitation of God falling short. Seven is the number of completion, the perfect number of God, and six doesn't make it. Or the number 666, may hearken back to the only other place 666 is mentioned in the Bible. 1 Kings 10, 14 says that Solomon received nearly six yearly 666 talents of gold. Some say then the Antichrist will be like Solomon, a good man who becomes corrupted. Modern interpretations of the Antichrist suggest that this child, it'll be a child, uh, obviously evil from his birth, as portrayed in the movie Omen. But the Antichrist may well be someone whose evil is only seen after his rise to power. And the elect are sealed on their foreheads to escape the destruction about to fall on the earth. So the followers of the beast are to escape the wrath against the church by bearing his mark. The text makes clear here that the beast is indeed one human being. But just as six falls short of the ideal number seven, this prophet who deceives the whole earth in this way is compromised, intended to underscore the evil in this individual. At some point, the saints are killed, others are taken into captivity, and the earth is forced into economic circumstance. The people who remain on earth who are followers of Jesus are going to go through a horrible time and a horrible tribulation. Jesus says no one would survive if it wasn't cut short. The number seven has been a very important number in Bible and in Revelation. The number seven in Hebrew and the word for the Lord's day of the Sabbath, Shabbat, are the same. God rested on the seventh day. Throughout the book of Revelation, the number seven 
is associated with completeness. We've seen that. A mark that is always six and never seven, he's introducing the mark of man. Doesn't matter how many times you repeat six or what you do to six, you can't get it to seven. It can never be seven. It can never be complete. It can never be divine. The mark of the beast is the mark of mankind, opposite of the divine plan of salvation. It is work-centered, man-centered, God-denying. Thus, we might say that the mark of the beast 666 means never God, never God, never God. Just as the angels cry out worship to Jesus, holy, 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 worthy, 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 God is saying to the Antichrist, you're just a six, six, and a six. A man who thinks he's God. So what we see in Revelation 13 is Satan's dream team, his unholy trinity. John has seen them. He tells us of the fake father, Satan. He tells us of the fake son, the Antichrist, and the fake spirit, the false prophet. All three united in purpose for the destruction of Christ and his followers. While we're here, I have many people who, as you know, many who challenge the Trinity. They claim the word Trinity is not mentioned in Scripture. The word communion is not in Scripture. Still follow it. However, it's an obvious underlying key core concept of Scripture. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and all one God. But there's something else that validates the Trinity. Satan tries to copy it. Satan tries to copy the things of God. The two beasts are satanic imitations. We have a false Christ and a false spiritual leader who promotes the false Christ. Satan can't create, but he can darn sure imitate. But remember, imitations work because they're similar. If they were so obviously different, it'd be easy to tell them apart. These, Antichrist is good at this. We have to be aware, we have to know the genuine so well that if we know the God of the Trinity, we know what's genuine, we won't be fooled by the fake. We need to spend less time focusing on all the speculation about the unholy Trinity and devote ourselves to abiding in the midst of Christ. If we're tuned in, the Holy Spirit will guide us from what's false. While the Holy Trinity is characterized by infinite truth, love, and goodness, the unholy trinity portrays opposites of deception, hatred, and evil. At the midpoint of the tribulation, the world will be totally enthralled by the Antichrist. They will worship Satan and the Antichrist himself. The Antichrist becomes emboldened, dispenses with all pretenses of being a peaceful leader. He's going to openly blaspheme God, break his peace treaty with the Jews, attack believers and the Jews, and desecrate the rebuilt Jewish temple, setting himself up as one to be worshipped. This particular event, as we said, is the abomination of desolation. Jesus says, when you see this, flee. If you're Jewish and you see this, get out of Jerusalem. So let's recap just to review. The second beast comes out of the earth, not the sea possibly indicating that he'll be an apostate Jew coming from Israel. He presents himself as a meek, mild, benevolent person, and horns indicate that he'll have power. The false prophet speaks like a dragon, meaning that he'll speak persuasively and deceptively to turn humans away from God and promote the worship of the Antichrist. The false prophet's capable of producing great signs and wonders, including bringing down fire from heaven. He sets up an image of the Antichrist for worship, gives life to the image, demands the worship of the image from all people, and executes anybody who refuses. We know from Revelation 20, verse 4, that his choice of execution is beheading. The false prophet will also compel each person to receive a permanent mark of some kind, just as slaves did in John's day, to show total devotion to the Antichrist and to renounce God. All those who receive the mark will be able to participate in commerce. Acceptance of the mark means eternal death. The Bible makes clear that humans will fully understand that by accepting the mark, they're not only accepting an economic system, but also a worship system, and they are rejecting Jesus. Revelation 13, 18 tells us the number of the beast is 666. No one knows really what that means. 
Some believe the Antichrist's first, middle, and last name will have six characters. Some believe the designation refers to a computer chip that will start with 666. Satan is the anti-God, the beast is the Antichrist, and the false prophet is the anti-spirit. This unholy trinity will persecute believers, deceive many others resulting in their death, but the kingdom of God will prevail. Daniel 7, 21, I was watching and the same horn was making war against the saints and prevailing against them until the Ancient of Days came and a judgment was made in favor of the saints of the Most High and the time came for the saints to possess the kingdom. Remember that no matter what you study in Revelation, Jesus wins at the end. So, we know that Jesus wins in the end, but John is very concerned about false prophets and false teachers. And he's concerned that Jewish people might miss the Messiah the second time. He knows that Jewish people are always looking for a sign, but they don't always test the sign. The last half of the tribulation is going to be a parade of demonic signs and wonders, and he's trying to get the Jewish people to be ready. He wrote about this as we said, Beloved, do not believe every spirit. Test the spirits. Make sure you know where they're from. All of us must be able to use the Holy Spirit to discern events in our lives, particularly supernatural ones. Let me give you a couple of examples. We need to avoid deception. There have been recently many apparitions of the Virgin Mary in many different countries around the world. So people have actually said they've seen the ghost of the Virgin Mary. Is that a miracle of God or not? How do we tell? These appearances appear legitimate. They're believed by millions of people. But when we compare what the apparitions say to what Scripture teaches, it's not even close. Over the course of several of these, we're told that God wants to establish worldwide devotion to Mary's Immaculate Heart, that souls will be saved if devotions to her Immaculate Heart are established, and that she is the mediatrix between man and God, that praying the rosary is required to enter heaven, that she receives and answers prayer, that taking communion makes reparation for sins committed against her, and that the blessed object should be worn and placed in homes. None of those messages align with Scripture. Mary does not have a sinless, immaculate heart. Devotion to Mary is not necessary. The Bible never instructs us to pray to anyone but God. Jesus is the only mediator between man and God. It's clear this is, this is not of God. The message of the apparitions clearly contradicts Scripture. Did people who claim to have seen Mary experience a real, real miracle? Yes, possibly. However, the entity calling itself Mary is not working for God's glory or pointing people to Jesus Christ. Rather, Mary is being glorified and people are told to earn their own salvation by works. Demonic miracles are real and they do occur. It's our responsibility to make sure that we don't give in to them. We have to keep our Bibles open and put God's truth ahead of any miracle we see. Is this of God or not? Over the last two weeks, many have asked me about a prayer service that's going on in Asbury, Kentucky, wanting to know whether this represents the revival that was seen in the early 20th century across America and the world. Is this of God or not? Well, all of us pray and want revival to break out around the world. We pray for it all the time. In the early 1900s, individual churches seemed to flood with an outpouring of the Holy Spirit, and people felt drawn to the Spirit to go there and find Christ. Thousands were moved to their knees and surrendered to Christ. Many had never been interested in God or really connected with God in any way. They were drawn to church, felt the empowered conviction of the Holy Spirit for their sins, and were coming to the altar falling down to be saved. The presence and conviction of the Spirit seemed palpable not only in that place, but surrounding that place. Many of these sites spontaneously developed around the world without knowledge of the others. It was considered a great worldwide revival called the Great Awakening. Thousands came to Christ as a result. Revival literally means to wake up. Non-believers all over the world became woke, but for God. 
Asbury's chapel service was extended into a small group prayer service that's been going on now for 10 days. It seems to be a social media phenomenon among college-age students, people coming from all over the world to join them in prayer. Most who are coming seem to be believers. It's developing a good bit of momentum with thousands waiting outside to come in and worship, and it's being promoted on social media and conservative news outlets. I'm all for it so far. I think people getting together to pray is a great thing if Jesus is at the center of it. I'm nervous about calling it a revival because a revival targets the lost and is a unique outpouring of the conviction of the Holy Spirit. I haven't heard much about non-believers participating, just large numbers of Christians going to that place to pray, but maybe I'm just misinformed. So I'm cautious, hopeful, guarded, but cautious. I also think this is an intermediate social craze that's quite far different from the revivals of the 1900s. Going there, it seems like believers, it's a TikTok challenge. I'm concerned that some are coming more to say they went than to connect with Jesus in a deeper way. I think the university has realized this too and have announced that they will be returning to normal hours and worship schedules. They're encouraging people to stay home and pray where they are. But here's the point. Even if miracles or supernatural things begin to happen at that university, I'm concerned that most believers would immediately assume it's God and would not test it. And that's exactly the concern that John had related to the Antichrist. That people would see the first miracle they see and they would just chase after it. He will mimic God. He will produce miracles. Supernatural things will happen and they're all fake. And we have to be very deep in our relationship with Christ to know the true trinity and to recognize the counterfeit. So once again, we get to the end of our time together. Well, what are we going to do with this? How, how do we apply this when we walk out of here? Well, once again, I think the key is to make sure we're abiding in Christ. We need to commit ourselves to knowing Scripture, connecting through prayer, and listening to the Holy Spirit. We need to make sure that we know God's voice. We need to be cautious about needing something supernatural to stamp our faith as genuine. If we know God intimately, we don't need to run after every experience that seems supernatural because we're having those experiences with him every day. Our charge last week was to make sure that we decide to never on earth worship a man or teach others to do the same. If people never worship a human, they'll never fall for the Antichrist. We need another charge based on what we've learned today. We need to decide in advance and help others see that we don't need anything else to validate God. What he has revealed to us is more than enough for us to be secure and completely confident in our faith. We don't need a supernatural thing to happen for us to know who Jesus is. The Jews chase signs, God says. It'll make them particularly vulnerable to deception. We don't need signs. The same is true for everyone who craves a supernatural experience for validation from God. I didn't say this, Jesus did. Matthew 12, 38. Then some of the scribes and Pharisees answered him saying, Teacher, we wish to see a sign from you. But he answered them, an evil and adulterous generation seeks a sign. No sign will be given to it except the sign of the prophet Jonah. What's the sign of the prophet Jonah? Jesus said, just like Jonah, I will die. I'll be buried for three days and I'll resurrect. What Jesus is saying is if that's not enough for you, then you're not, you don't know me. You see, we can join an adulterous generation if we start chasing after miracles to validate what God has already told us happened. Everything he did was at the cross. You either believe it or you don't. You don't need a supernatural sign to validate that message. It's stamped in Scripture. Too many Christians chase from possible sign to possible sign, joining an adulterous generation. Let's just commit in advance that it's not going to be us. 
Jesus said the sign of Jonah is enough. If dying and resurrecting didn't convince you, signs won't either. You'll just want another one. We have all that we need. We don't need to chase the supernatural. Evaluate what you experience and allow the Holy Spirit to show and teach you truth, but decide in advance that you don't need any further validation than what you already know. Anytime we're in doubt, we make sure that whatever's being taught and done aligns with Scripture. If the miracle worker is teaching something contrary to God's Word, then his miracles, no matter how convincing they may seem, are demonic delusions. Supernatural does not mean God. Let's pray. God, I thank you that you warn us in advance. I thank you, God, that you teach us what we're to know, that you gave us this entire book so that we would not be fooled. God, help us to know you so well that we could pick out a fake at a million yards away. Help us to know your voice so well that we know when somebody's not speaking of you. Help us, God, to be so convinced of our salvation and aware of the truth of what you did on the cross that if not a single thing happens to us the rest of our lives, we're good. Help us to not chase after experiences unless it's with you. Help us, God, to learn to abide in you so that we know the truth. God, I pray for those who are going to be alive during the mid-tribulation and beyond, to the believers who are going to hold on to their faith as their heads are being chopped off, to those who refuse to take the mark of the beast. God, suffering always brings glory. Would you glorify them for standing for you? God, would you help us as we leave this day to know that our relationship with you is secure and to live in that? Help us, God, to teach others to do the same. We love you. We thank you. We ask it in Jesus' holy name.